Good afternoon. It's a great, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I am neither an Australian nor an agronomist, so I'm in many ways uniquely unqualified to be saying anything to this august group. What I would like to offer, for what it's worth, is a brief perspective on how uh, data and information technology more broadly um, have been changing in recent years, and what are the, some of the models and frameworks that we see evolving. Now, if I can get to my presentation, therefore. There we go. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start, if I may, with a story. Um, Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian poet and novelist, wrote a very famous short story. It doesn't even have a title. Um, and in this short story, he recounted the tale of a lost kingdom. This was a kingdom somewhere you can imagine in the Andes where the aristocracy were obsessed with maps. And however, each map that they cast was deemed unsatisfactory, it wasn't good enough. So they launched a new project for an even more ambitious map until finally they launched the ultimate mapping project, a map of their kingdom on a scale of one to one. And according to Borges, if you visit this kingdom to this day, you will find fragments of this failed project um, in various parts of the terrain. Now, Borges obviously had a lot of philosophical ideas behind this, and it was a tale of human hubris and so on. But what I would like to suggest is that in many ways, that idea, the idea of a map on a scale of one to one, is indeed precisely the image that we should have of where technology in general and data in particular are taking us. And to illustrate the point, consider the following. <clears throat> this is what the Google car sees. Uh, in the inset on the left, you have the view from the dashboard. But in the larger part of the screen, what you see is the car's detection not just of the roads and the bridges and the traffic lanes, but also of other vehicles, also of cyclists, of traffic lights, and so forth. Indeed, there's a wonderful moment just coming up where the car faces the challenge of trying to overtake a typically wayward, erratic, and irrational and suicidal Northern Californian cyclist who cannot make up his mind whether he is turning left or turning right. And notwithstanding his random flapping of his hands, nonetheless, the, the car successfully passes him. Indeed, to this day, uh, the uh, Google car has only experienced two accidents, uh, one of which was when it was rammed from the rear while parked, and the other of which was when it was being driven manually by a Google engineer. <laughs> now, <clears throat> what are the components of the technology that we see here? What I'd like to suggest is that it's worth looking at this because those components are actually quite general. One of them is, very simply and obviously, the existence of a general, comprehensive, and accurate map of the terrain. In Google's case, of course, this would be the Google Maps map of the roads. But in fact, we have many examples of that, and an obvious agricultural example would be the use of satellite data in order to know not just the, uh, uh, the bounds of the terrain, but to understand things like the humidity or the pH factors uh, of the soil which enables all sorts of um, uh, aspects of precision agriculture that would not have been possible before. But there is actually, I would argue, a, uh, at least two other mechanisms that are involved that are less obvious. <clears throat> One of which is that the map is generated from things describing themselves. This is a classic example. This is a view of the United States um, taken from a satellite at night. What you see is the pattern of light from cities, railroad tracks, uh, roadways, um, airplanes, and so forth. And very obviously, you can see the shape of the country. Notoriously, if we go to Africa, it is the dark continent, the continent where um, uh, such uh, infrastructure is conspicuous by its absence. But not entirely, and that is in many ways what makes the story interesting. Orange, the telecommunications company, the French telecommunications company, is the monopoly provider of a cell phone service in the Ivory Coast. 
What Orange did was they, they collected metadata on how people use the telephones in the cell phones in the Ivory Coast. Nine months worth of data for the entire population. And by doing that, they were able to create networks like this, where you could see the movements of people, because of course the cell phone registers with the nearest tower, so that the telephone company actually knows where it is, um, <clears throat> and who speaks to whom, and even in fact, what language they speak in. What Orange did, having collected this data at very low cost, was simply to publish it. They anonymized it and they published it. And they said to the world's researchers, go at it, see what information, see what patterns you can find in this data. And interestingly, 82 papers were written by researchers and academics around the world using this unique data set as a source of insight. One of those papers came up with the following rather elegant analysis. Some researchers at IBM looked at the um, pattern of commuting in Abidjan, which is the largest city in uh, the Ivory Coast. Now, they weren't looking at where people get on the bus and get off the bus, which the bus company kind of knew from its own information. What they were looking at was where people started their journey and where people finished their journey. And that enabled them to think, therefore, of a very large optimization problem, which is that you've got a finite number of buses, you've got a population who need to, on a daily basis, get to and from two locations, their home and their work. What is the optimal allocation of bus routes that will um, minimize the time that it takes the average citizen of the town to get to and from work? And they formulated this problem. The mathematics is quite trivial. trivial. The computation, of course, is horrendous. They formulated this problem. They ran it on a Hadoop cluster for two days. And sure enough, they got an answer. And the answer was a reconfiguration of the Abidjan bus system, which, without adding a single bus, shaved 10% off the average commute time. Now, you think of the effective impact on, as it were, the GDP of the country to reduce everybody's workday by 10%, and the impact is truly extraordinary. Why was that possible? It was possible because of a very, very large data set which had not been available before, and because of a few smart people and access to some very powerful machines, but only for a few days. In scale terms, the really difficult bit was the data. Once the data was available, all sorts of things became possible. But that's just the second mechanism by which these maps can be created. Um, the maps created through objects describing themselves, in this case, the cell phone declaring its location. There is a third mechanism, which is the most recent and in many ways the most profound. And that is the ability of machines to actually perceive and understand their environment. There was an immense breakthrough in something called convolutional neural networks about five years ago. Uh, again, based on big data, um, that made it possible for machines to recognize, for example, objects in a photograph. And an annual competition held by Stanford University to solve this particular problem was won by a team from Microsoft this year with a solution that is more accurate in predicting, the, in identifying the objects in a photograph than is the average human. But that is just the beginning. Look at this. This is a video that was created about six weeks ago by a graduate student in Amsterdam. What he did was he was running a piece of software on his Macintosh that is using neural network technology, not just to identify objects, but to caption. That is to say, to create grammatical sentences describing what is going on. And what you see, he, what you see is, is that he is walking down the street and the, the uh, camera embedded in his laptop is uh, generating images which the software is interpreting. Now you will observe very obviously that about half of these captions are incorrect. This is about where the identification of photographs was about two or three years ago. And everybody knows full well that at the rate at which this is advancing, within two or three years, we will have, instead of a boat is parked on the side of the water, we will have a boat is moored at the side of the water because the machine by then will have learned the correct grammar. It is confidently predicted that within five years, a machine will be able to watch a YouTube video and um, uh, generate a grammatical, sensible, one paragraph summary of what is the story of that video. That is how near uh, machine learning is. So when we stand back <coughs> from these phenomena, we actually have these three different ways that these maps can be created. What underlies them is four 
dramatically new technologies. One is the Internet of Things, the vast proliferation of uh, sensors um, uh, in the world. It's estimated today that there are 168 sensors for every man, woman, and child on the planet. The cost of these sensors is dropping by an order of magnitude every five or six years. It's confidently expected that that number will multiply by a factor of 100 in the next 10 years. Secondly, we have big data. And I'm sure you have heard of the statistic frequently quoted that the world's stock of data is doubling every two years. Thirdly, we have artificial intelligence. Data, as Jackie said earlier, data is worthless without the insight that interprets it. And it is artificial intelligence that has been the subject of many major breakthroughs, the one particular one about neural networks um, in just the past five years. And then finally, we have mobility. We have the fact that the information and the insight that is being generated can now be used at the point where it is needed, at the point where it is relevant. Most obviously, in the case of um, uh, consumers, in the form of information delivered to your smartphone. And the number of phones in the world is now greater than the number of people. There are two and a half billion smartphones in the world. Within five years, they will all be smartphones. This is just a matter of time. Now, <clears throat> a couple of points about this. One, this is one big system. This isn't a pattern that replicates itself millions of times. The Internet of Things is billions of devices connected to each other via IP addresses and the web. The big, big data, when we talk about big data, what we're talking about is data that, has, that is on servers, <coughs> excuse me, or on laptops, all of which, again, have IP addresses, meaning that they are connected to each other, meaning that, in principle, at almost zero cost and at almost zero latency, they can exchange information. Now, they may not, because, of course, different people own it. There's issues of privacy, um, uh, intellectual property, all sorts of reasons why institutionally it doesn't happen. But from a technical point of view, it is one data set. In similar fashion, very obviously, the phones are all connected to the global telecommunications network. So what we're talking about is the emergence of this macro pattern. The other key point to emphasize is how recent all of these things were. If you turn the clock back seven or eight years, nobody was talking about any of them. Now, <clears throat> in that world, what are the institutions that are needed? What are the institutions that make it possible? And the answer here is a little paradoxical because it's an alliance between the very big and the very small. One component of this architecture is data centers, things like cloud computing, of which I'm sure you've heard. This is a, <clears throat> a not a typical uh, data center belonging to Google. The world's largest data center, which is under construction in China, uh, is the size of 120 football fields, if you can imagine a building of that size. It's actually larger than the US Pentagon. Um, <clears throat> why? Because there are immense economies of scale in the accumulation, protection, um, and management of data, and because obviously, you know, it's only one, there's a fixed cost to data, there's a fixed cost to gathering and to storing the data, and then once it has been gathered and stored, there's essentially zero cost to reusing it. So once the data has been collected on a single occasion, it is actually not worth duplicating that data on another occasion, except for reasons, for example, of backup or privacy. Um, so, therefore, there are massive economies of scale, and these kinds of data centers, <coughs> excuse me, these kinds of data centers are exploiting that. But that's only half the equation. Precisely because the data is amenable to these massive economies of scale, the interpretation of the data can actually fragment. It turns out that four IBM engineers in Dublin running a Hadoop cluster can actually solve problems perfectly efficiently if they merely have access to those colossal data sets. One rather interesting example of that at working in practice is a company called Kaggle, which was founded, interestingly, by an Australian. Um, <clears throat> Kaggle is a, basically a website that curates contests. Companies that have data problems post their data, usually in, in anonymized form, onto Kaggle, and then Kaggle orchestrates a contest by which anybody in the world, hackers, scientists, engineers, researchers, PhD students, and so on, can try to solve the problem competing for a prize. This particular graph shows a Kaggle contest where the client was Allstate, Allstate the um, largest American property insurance company. 
property and casualty insurance company. This is automotive insurance. And they had an algorithm, they all state had an algorithm, which they developed over many years from their actuarial work and so on, to predict from the application form what is the expected loss rate from a given potential customer. And this would be a basis for pricing the insurance. It would be a basis, obviously, for maybe deciding whether or not to take the insurance. The contest was to try to improve on that algorithm. And as you can see from the graph that you're looking at, what happened over just a 12-week period was that the, um, uh, the, the, these competing teams were able to improve on Allstate's original formula by a factor of nearly 300%. Now, there's a very interesting footnote to this rather spectacular story of very rapid innovation. And that is that the, I did a back of the envelope calculation to estimate the value of that improvement to Allstate. And basically what it is is obviously rejecting bad deals and accepting good ones, maybe even pricing down to win the good deals because you realize how good they are. And the value to Allstate is approximately $50 million per year. The prize that was won by the team that came up with the best solution to the problem was $6,000. So you notice a rather radical asymmetry between the value of being the smartest person in the room and the value of controlling the data. It turns out that it's control of the data that is what makes or breaks. It is the, it's the basis of reward um, in this emerging world. The other thing that's very striking is that the team that, in a parallel, strictly accurate, in a very parallel problem, problems in toxicology that was solved uh, for Merck, the winning team didn't even know about the contest until the last two weeks. So they rather hurriedly marshaled and entered the contest, and believe it or not, on their first shot, they won it a grand prize again of something like $5,000. But the interesting point was that the problem was to predict the toxic side effects of drugs, something on which Merck had been working for 30 years. Merck had been using um, clinical trials at immense expense in order to uh, try to understand that. The question was, can you just by looking at the molecular structure predict those kinds of toxic side effects? The answer is yes, you can. This team from the University of Toronto won the contest. Not a single member of that team had a background in chemistry or biology, still less toxicology. Nobody knew a thing about the problem. What they knew about was how to analyze data. So, in summary, <clears throat> we are moving from a world defined in traditional business school, business school professor terms, by things from a world where things were defined by things called value chains. The value chain is what? It's the idea that a business is a set of heterogeneous activities and the, the physical product kind of goes through those activities as it is converted from raw material into final good. Think of a factory, think of a Ford Motor assembly line, raw materials go one in, cars come out the other. And that basic idea that a business is defined by its value chain is fundamental to how things like business strategy have been thought about for 30 years. Now, in fact, what is happening in consequence of exactly the forces I described is that that value chain is breaking up. First of all, transaction costs are falling so that you can do these pieces se separately. Secondly, where there are economies of scale, as in data, as in data processing, we're seeing colossal consolidation into platform businesses such as Google and um, Microsoft Azure and so on. And thirdly, where what matters is individual initiative, individual talent, smarts, creativity, experimentation, as with all of those grad students all trying to solve the problems I've described, that fragments. You don't even need to be part of a corporation to do that. People will do that autonomously or in small teams. So when you put these patterns together, what you see is a transposition of the structure of whole industries. You see a shift from a vertically integrated set of businesses, all of which essentially look alike, to a horizontally stratified set of businesses which are very fundamentally different from each other and which provide services to each other. We call that a stack because that's the term that people would use in software. Stack is fundamental to the economics of information, just as the value chain, the traditional idea of physical flows, is fundamental to the economics of things. If there's one phenomenon that defines the way our world is changing, it is that we are moving from a world dominated by the economics of things to a world dominated by the economics of information. Thank you very much.